All right, guys. Continuing with the lecture about T cell receptor, we have talked about the T cell receptor comparison with immunoglobulins. We have talked about the T cell receptor has a dimer structure, dimeric structure, with the which resembles very much like an FAB and other things which we just talked about. Now let's see how the T cell receptor formation is done. So that is a DNA rearrangement. It is true for immunoglobulin and it is true for the T cell receptor. So pay attention to this one, very important topic and when we will go to immunoglobulin, we are going to reuse the same concept and I will say here was a concept we talked about and here is for the detail. So pay attention to this one, let us see how these receptors or molecules are formed. One more, one more concept before we go, the T cell receptor difference from immunoglobulin is also the T cell receptors are always anchored on the cell surface, they are never found in free state. Immunoglobulins on the other hand can be found on the cell surface or in the free state, more commonly in the free state than in the cell surface. These are created by the B cells, so not all proteins are created by the liver cells. Here is an example of proteins which are created by the B cells and then released in the plasma. So these immunoglobulins are created by the B cells. In the beginning B cells can keep them on their surface, but then these can be released in the plasma and the majority will be released in the plasma. The other one thing is that immunoglobulins have gotten types which are as we talked earlier, there is immunoglobulin M, G, D, E and A. T cell receptor does not have a this typology, this difference IgG is because of difference in the heavy chains. T cell receptor does not have any such thing, so it does not have such types. The only thing which you should remember is T cell has alpha and beta chains. There are some T cells which have gotten gamma and eta chains as well, but these are less common than these. When we talk about T cell receptor with alpha and beta which are more common, we write them like this T cell receptor alpha beta and then you can also write T cell receptor gamma and eta. So let us talk about their formation, genetic mechanism. So let me take this out. So here is an interesting basic concept to keep in mind, our body need to be able to handle millions and billions kinds of pathogens or antigens. We cannot come up with all possible structures of pathogens before we encounter them. So body has a very simple mechanism to handle it, I love this mechanism, I am just so much impressed. The mechanism is this, that if I ask you to go make a wrench, go make a thing which can connect or combine with any of the things present here, that would become a problem because now this thing is different and this thing is different and this thing is different and so on. Instead, if you went out and you said instead of making a structure which can combine with other kinds of structures, so I am going to make a computer monitor here, this is my computer monitor, I am going to make a computer, a mouse, computer mouse not the other mouse. So the point is there are so many types of things, if I ask you to make something which can bind them all that would be a problem. Instead if you said okay you know what, I know that these are all the things at least in the organic systems, most of these are protein made. So instead of binding creating some tool which can bind with all of them, how about if I take simplified pieces of protein and hope that these fragments of proteins are more common. 
So maybe this fragment of protein is present in all of these shapes. So if I can find a plier, if I can make a wrench which can connect with this kind of a protein, then it can actually connect with all of these structures. That is a very interesting, very impressive idea. That means that this is the basis of immunology now. That means whenever a pathogen comes into our body, body's first job is to simplify the pathogen. What does that mean? Pick up the pathogen and slice and dice it, break it apart, pick up a piece of glass and throw it and make smaller pieces out of it. Those smaller pieces will have sequences in them for which we can make standard connecting systems. That is how the body, so what body is saying is if you got 1000 kinds of bacteria and a 1000 kind of viruses and a 1000 kind of fungi, fungi and if you break them all and put the broken things together, their fragments would look similar. And if I can find similar fragments, then I can combine with them and I can fight with them. That is a beautiful way of handling pathogen or antigens. So now let us see how does that happen. So the genes that encode the immunoglobulins and T cell receptors are present on chromosome 2, 22 and 14. So these genes are not all present in one place, they are present in various chromosomes. So 2, 22 and 14 or actually we do not even say genes, we say pools of genes. What does that mean? So before we go there, keep one thing, one more thing in your mind. So these are the chromosomes. Keep this in mind that we have V regions, we have D regions, we have J regions and we have C regions. What does that mean? Nothing. What we are saying here is, is simple, what we are saying here is a final immunoglobulin molecule, a final immunoglobulin molecule shows structures that are formed by the genes in this region, some structures. So maybe a part of this immunoglobulin molecule, let us say this part is made by genes here. Another part is made by the genes sitting here. Another part is made by the gene sitting here and another part which is made by the gene sitting here. That is what we mean. You can call them as separate gene pools, variable, diverse, junction and constant gene pools. Their names do mean something but for us they are just separate gene pools sitting on separate chromosomes 2, 22 and 14. Let us make an immunoglobulin molecule using these gene pools to be able to understand it better. So I am going to make regardless of these chromosomes, I am going to just make a string of DNA genes and then see how we can make an immunoglobulin molecule from there. This is beautiful. So let us do it. Let us say the V region, we say V1 gene, so this V1 gene means it is a gene present somewhere on these chromosomes which can give rise to a peptide sequence which will go in the variable region. So let us call it V1. There is another gene called V2. What does that mean? You can either use this or use this. They both are going to make some protein sequence that can go in the immunoglobulin at the variable region. Let us make one more V3 and so on. So let us say we go V3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 up to Vn, it could be 70, it could be 80. So these are all the possible genes which can give rise to the part of immunoglobulin, variable part of immunoglobulin, okay. Question, 
do you think that all of them at the same time work to make the immunoglobulin? No. This is the very first very important concept, no. One of them at one time, in one cell, one of them will be chosen. Okay. So, keep that concept in your mind, we are continuing on, I will come back to this concept and I will ask you about this. So, now second is diversity region, D region. So, let us say there are some D region genes as well and again let us call them, I am sorry about the color here, D1, D2, D3 and so on, Dn. One of these would also be picked up. Then let us say VDJ, J1, J2, J3, you get the point, right? Jn. And finally, C region, C pool, C. So, C1, actually, they are not C1s. They are C, 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 C. They are, remember we have immunoglobulin M, G, D, E, A. These are those. So, gamma, uh, mu, how do I write mu? Mu, I think mu comes first in the sequence mu, gamma, then mu gamma um, epsilon actually d epsilon e and a. So, these are the gene pools with those genes we are going to make an immunoglobulin region immunoglobulin. So, what is an immunoglobulin? We have heavy chains which have got a variable region right and constant regions. So, heavy chain, variable region, constant regions and then the light chain, variable region and constant region, right. We are going to make this thing from here. So, how do we do that? The first, very first thing, there is an enzyme called or actually two enzymes called RAG1 and RAG2. recombinase activation gene 1 and recombinase activation gene 2. These two genes when activated produce the enzyme recombinase. These genes when they are active they make a protein called recombinase. The recombinase is going to do this what I am going to do. So, for your purpose I am recombinase, I am the enzyme which is going to act here. What do I do? I am the enzyme recombinase is active. I come here and I say okay, you know what out of this DNA I am going to pick up V1 and do me a favor, you are listening to this lecture, you decide a different V you decide 2 or 3 or 70 or 50. I am going to pick up V1 for my rearranged DNA. This enzyme's function is DNA rearrangement. So, what is happening is DNA rearrangement is going to happen. So, the first thing out of the V pool, we picked up one gene. I picked up V1, you are also a recombinase, pick up some other V maybe 2 or 3 or 5 or 10 or something. Then out of the D diversity gene pool, I am also going to pick up one. So, let us say I picked up, okay, let me see, close my eyes, I pick up D3. So, I gotten V1 and I have gotten D3. What am I doing? I am making new DNA, I am making rearranged DNA. Then I go here and for J, I bring the whole J here. So, that is a funny thing, J does not get selected. So, I get all the J's here. 
So, J 1 to J 2 and so on. And finally, I pick up mu the very first one. Actually, the, the actual thing is that instead of the mu, it is mu and d which come in. So, let us pick up one. Again, I am not doing a immunoglobulin at this time. I am showing you how constant region mu, how this rearrangement DNA rearrangement or recombination works. Okay. So, now this was the original DNA. We took these genes from these chromosomes, we put them in a line, we activated recombinase, we generated recombinase by using RAG1 and RAG2 enzymes, their deficiency RAG1 and 2 also causes severe combined immunodeficiency disease. Imagine this, if these are not there, then the recombinase is not there. If recombinase is not there, then the immunoglobulins are not going to be formed. Then the T cell receptors are not going to be formed. That means B cell and T cell are not going to function. That is SCID, right? So, I was right that in our today's lecture, we have a lot of concepts which are related to pathology of SCID. What are the concepts? Can you remind me? CD3 defect, T cell receptor defect, Janus kinase defect, ZAP70 defect, and now you are seeing a defect in RAG1 or 2 can cause SCID because if these two are defective, then the recombinase enzyme will be defective. That means immunoglobulin molecule formation or T cell receptor formation both will be defective, not or they both will be defective. That means patient would have infections or it will continue.